your depression, your anger, your frustration, your sadness are a function of your love not being expressed. At a younger age than most, I was given more material success than one could ever really imagine. But there was just this feeling of like sadness, loneliness. If it wasn't fame and the success that was going to change my moment to moment experience of life, then what? People ask me all the time, like, why did you walk across America? I want to feel what it's like to be challenged in a real way and then choose. I'm going to keep going anyways. It's the only way we grow. Because you try to walk 3,000 miles across America, something's going to go wrong. Mike Posner is recovering from a rattlesnake bite. This is a fucking crossroads. I'm either going to go back and be this like shell of myself, shell of my potential, or I'm actually going to become somebody I'm proud of. There's probably millions of people out there right now that have a feeling like they have more to give than they're giving. We have to have the courage to look where we're scared and put something in front of us that inspires us go, hey, if I got to the other side of this, man, how cool would my life be? I like a goal that's so big. If I get it, it obliterates all my other goals because it's gonna change who I am if I get there. Countries are wide, mountains are tall, but the man that I've become is my best album of all. beautiful beings. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a brilliant mind, a beautiful soul, to see how we can learn more about the true nature of self and the world around us at deeper and deeper levels. Our guest today is a very accomplished artist, Grammy-nominated, whose songs have billions of streams. I've gotten to know him as somebody that just lifts the energy of the room when he walks into it. He's somebody that I'm sure, as you will feel today, radiates authenticity And he's got an incredibly bold, courageous, adventurous spirit that's led him to journeys like walking across America on his own two feet to climbing Mount Everest and perhaps the most bold endeavor, which is to fully know and express and share his true self. Mike Posner, bro, thanks for being here. Thank you. What an intro. <laughs> Man, <laughs> the how was traffic? Thank you. How was traffic on the way over here? It was it was the best commute ever. <laughs> ever. So thank you for having me, brother. And yeah. My neighbor. My neighbor. Yeah. yeah. We're just two two Michigan kids with big dreams out here now. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Southfield, Michigan. You were raised in Southfield, That's Michigan. Right. Yeah. And now we're like four minutes, five minutes walking distance from each other. (laughs) Insane, insane. It's been such an honor to get to know you and just get to feel you more. And I've seen, you know, loved your music and get to see pieces of you and over, you know, over the years here and there, but getting to feel you as a, just as a friend and connecting more and more. Like I spoke to in the intro, I just really feel you radiate authenticity. I feel the realness of you. and, um, And it's a privilege to be able to see somebody that's had big success and then kind of realize the the true inner qualities that one wants to cultivate. And so I'm curious, as you started out on your path of becoming a musician, seeking success, what did you think initially achieving success would give you? Mm. And then what did you discover that it actually did or didn't give you? Well, first of all, thank you, Andre, for everything you just said, had me on and it's been a gift for me as well to get to know you and I always feel very as I've told you before other times we've hung out I always feel really comfortable around you and you know we're neighbors sometimes we hang out at the end of the day like I'm done working and it's like feels like just taking off a tight shoe being around you so thank you Um, but to answer your question when I was young I had childhood filled with a lot of anger a lot of anger and anger that went unexpressed and eventually turned into depression and i had this underlying sense of just feeling like i didn't belong you know and i thought that if i attained some level of notoriety or fame or financial success that it would sort of just plug up that insecurity that was just always there. 
And of course, I don't have to tell you, you know, I, I worked really hard on <laughs> taming the notoriety, the fame, the popularity, the financial success. And my moment to moment experience of life was was pretty much like exactly the same, you know, that that feeling of not belonging and it, it was it was just still there. And uh that that triggered a real real feeling of disillusionment. So even though my moment-to-moment -moment experience after success was was pretty much the same as before, it, it was more dreadful because before I had this success, I, was, I had this thing to look forward to that I thought would solve it all. And after I had that thing and it didn't solve it all, it's actually worse because I, I, I didn't know what. So it was, it was really difficult. It was really, really difficult. Um, and even though I had like everything going for me externally, internally, I, I, I didn't know what was what. But as, as you know, life is always happening for us, not to us. So when I look back at that difficult period now, I see it was really a gift because, you know, at a, at a younger age than most, I was given just more material success than one could ever really imagine, you know beyond what I imagined for myself. And so because it, it didn't solve, like if, if, if it wasn't the fame and the success that was gonna change my moment to moment experience of life, then what? So I got the privilege of at 22, 23 to start asking, and then what? And my life since then, it's been over a decade, has been the quest for the answers of, Okay, if it's not these things, then then what what is it out there that would change, that does change a human's moment-to-moment -moment experience of life? And it's been an incredible journey since then. And um, now I'm, I'm like we talk about I'm a I'm a student. I'm still learning. And I'm a teacher at the same time, you know, because I've I have stumbled upon some things that have made a difference in my life and and others that haven't. So mm. it's my my dharma to just share those things, you know, mm. when I can. Yeah, I'm excited to go through some of those things that you've come to realize are truths that actually had unlocked and transformed and shifted your day-to-day -day experience of who you are and the world around you. Uh, but I do want to stay on this thread a little bit longer because so many of us, I know I have in periods of my life and still fall into the trap sometimes, and I know everybody who's listening to this definitely do, thinking that there is this, you know, after achieving something one day, one in the future, then the happiness, the peace, the contentment kind of will just come by product of you achieving those things. And, you know, however many conversations you hear, or people you say that success is not in the destination, it's in the journey. Sometimes, you, I mean, often just got to go through it yourself to really taste it, to realize it. And so when you look back at your story and your journey, connecting the dots, looking backwards, as Steve Jobs would always, you know, often talk about, what do you kind of perceive as a few of those pivotal moments where you had tasted a big high, big moment of success, and then the after moment of, oh, I kind of still feel the same. Take us through a few of those moments in your career. I first got popular when I was, you uh, see, a junior, senior in college. I started to lead this kind of strange double life where I was still in school, but I was starting to become famous. And I can remember that it got to a point where I had to change. I didn't have to. I chose to change my phone number. And I just remember being on this flight going from a, I just played like a fraternity house. It was like the beginning of my career. And it's like, some wild party all night. And then I was flying back to my college to go to class and just being on the plane and nothing really happened, but there was just this feeling of like sadness, loneliness. And like, I'm really, I'm really in this alone. There was another moment, probably several months later where things that really started to take off for me and I was sitting with my manager and I you know, just finished college and 
It's kind of this like budding pop star and <laughs> it's like take my shirt off at concerts. And uh, he started walking me through my schedule. He said, so you're going to go from LA to Columbus to New York and then you're going to go to Paris and London back to LA two days. Then you're going to go to San Francisco. I said, well, when am I going to go home? And I remember he looked at me, he said, that's not what you signed up for. And just kind of this feeling of being like underwater, like wanting to come up and take a breath, but not being able to. I was like, wow, this, this like really isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be, you know? And it's a lot harder. And... It's just a lot of time alone. It's a lot of time. It's a solo journey. You know, it's like you're working with other people, but you're on the journey alone. You're like, I'm not in a band, you know? <laughs> so that that was one. That was, I guess that was two points. That was around when like Cooler Than Me came out? Yeah. I remember the night that inspired me to write, I took a pill in Ibiza, was four or five years after Cooler Than Me had come out and my career had really fizzled out. At the time, I was considered a one-hit wonder in the music industry. And, and by that, I was. You know, I hadn't had my second hit yet. And my career really, like, for people that worked in the music industry, was considered over. You know, I was someone people would call to write songs for other artists. And I had some good success doing that. But as far as my career was, it was considered done. And my friend Avicii, you know, rest in peace. I loved him because he, he always wanted to work with me no matter where I was on the charts. He first hit me up to work on Levels. You remember that song, Levels? Mm -hmm. He sent me that instrumental. I was like, hey, can you write something to this? I, I tried like 10 times. I, I was like, it kind of sounds better when I'm not on it, you know? And eventually he just put that sample on. Whoa, sometimes I get a good feel. Anyway, so it, he, all, he he didn't care. He said just, I, he respected my artistry and my writing. And he always wanted to work with me, no matter if I was number one or done. And so he said, come to, come to Sweden to work on my album. And I was like, cool. Like I had nothing going on. I was trying to get something going, but it really had fizzled out. So I flew to Sweden and I was like, man, I'm not, he had two days for me. You know, I was like, well, that's a long way to go. I've never been to Sweden before. So maybe I'll stay in Europe for a while. And I knew he had a concert coming up afterwards. So I sort of like invited myself. Like, hey man, can can I go to your show after? And the show was in Ibiza, you know, a couple of days after we were in the studio. He said, yeah, of course. But they were, you know, he was playing the concert. So the, you know, the promoter again, like the, the hotel suite is like the nicest hotel stuff. And I, I didn't really like, you know, I had made some money, but it was like, <laughs> I didn't have it like that. You know, I w and he's probably going on jet and all this stuff, you know. And so I went like the day before by myself. Yeah, it's like I almost want to cry thinking I was just in Ibiza alone at this hotel and I would walk outside and it's like all these, everyone was there with their friends, you know, like celebrating life. Man, I was just by myself. The next day he came to the show and it was when I still drank. And he went on the stage and he was playing a concert and, and he even played like the song we wrote a couple of days before. It was kind of cool, but I just felt so low because, oh, like, man, that used to be me up there. And 
And so I started to drink, you know, and, and it's so sad. But I, I left like the VIP area and I started to walk around. And I, I really just was like hoping someone would recognize me. It's so embarrassing to say now. I was walking around, imagine I'm walking around at my friend's concert. It's like guy who had a moment of fame four years before. And I'm just like hoping someone's going to say, are you Mike Posner? So I could feel like someone sees me. And eventually someone did. They recognized me and then they said like, you know, you want to take one of these? They had this little plastic bag of like pills and I was already drunk. And I was like, sure. Took this pill. And I was up all night, like grinding my teeth, you know. <laughs> like it like was the club called Pasha? I think so. I don't know. I, I don't know. know. I assume you've been to Ibiza I, I before. I haven't actually. Yeah. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually, yeah, you took that pill in Ibiza. Yeah, I think um I think um I think it's called Pasha. It's cutting mm-hmm. and play a deep house. Yeah. You know, like boom. <laughs> like no melody you know it's dark it's dark and I was to fly back to the states the next day and I just like woke up and I felt like death and so that was like another mo- definitely another moment mm. you asked about moments where yeah. I had achieved some success but it like wasn't really what I thought and of course, I wrote a song about that night. I took a pill in Ibiza. And it was a song about how my career was over, basically. And ironically, you know, it became really popular and like reinvigorated reinvigorated my career in some ways. And so I think I think all these all these moments, man, of course, like we have external success, but it, it really earns you no points. I'll fast forward to an, another mo- high moment, which is like uh, literally and metaphorically high, which is when I summited Mount Everest. It was one of the, the greatest moments of my life. Right after I summited Mount Everest, I went back to this retreat center I love called Tara Mandala Retreat Center and it's a really special place because they offer solitary retreats and to my knowledge it's the only place in the U.S. where you can do a solo solitary retreat where you where you literally don't see another human being for the entirety of your stay and I think there are other places like that but you have to kind of be a part of the sangha and their community to, to do it. In this place, you have to apply, but if they accept you, you can go. So I'd already done it, I think, two or three times before. I think at that time, two times before. And so I, I planned, like I, I had walked be, right before that and I kind of said, I need to, I need to stop. So I'm going to go to the the retreat center. You had walked across America, you had summoned Mount Everest, and then you go to like, what is it, 21, 30 day? It was, that one was 21 days. Silent solo retreat. Just alone. Yeah, unpack. Yeah. And I got there and within like 12 hours, I was like, the game is being present. You know, when you're, when you're alone there, you're, prior accomplishments earn you no points in the present moment. They're worth nothing. And the more your mind drifts to the past or the future, it's like the more you're losing that internal game. And so I play external games and they're fun. And I think they're an important element of life, but they're just one element. You know, and I'm playing external games now and I have goals that I'm working towards now. You know, I'm not a monk. Like I'm in the marketplace. I, I have a job, you know, I have projects. Um, and it's just important to, I think, contextualize the external games as external games that don't earn points in the actual present moment. 
and they don't change your moment to moment experience of life. Like the only way to do that is here and now. Like this is <laughs> this is my life. This is your life. To everyone watching, like, this is your life right now, wherever you're watching this from. Look around, like this is it. You know, if we can't be happy, if we can't be content right here, right now, we then we never can. Yeah, it's the the ultimate game of life that you're actually finding true success in, which is the quality and the uh, the ability you have to to bring that true presence in everything that you're doing. So I'm curious because in those moments of solitude, right? Like I've I've had you know in in different forms periods of where I've done that as well, and kind of have sometimes I've been writing more quotes recently and one that came through was just like when you get quiet what needs to be heard gets loud and so when you go into those moments where you're extremely still and you're very silent whatever is unprocessed those that anger from childhood those ulterior motives that drove you to you know find that and seek that external success in the first place they start to become prevalent in your experience and you start to realize okay why have I been doing the things I've been doing in my life? And you start to go on that process of self-inquiry. So what did you start to hear as you got quiet? Oh, well, it's the worst. You know, <laughs> it's the worst. I think I shared with you, we were hanging once. Like whenever I go on those retreats, I always leave with some pretty like intense apologies to make, mm. you know. Um, I'm a high-performing human. Like I'm going forward every single day and man when I stop like when I take that time to stop I realize like whoa I I was a little reckless here you know and wow I did something there that like man that is not consistent with who I want to be and I think that's a really important practice and I don't think you have to go into solitude to experience it or to like, but I love this Carl Jung quote. I've been digging on it lately, which is one does not achieve enlightenment by imagining figures of light. One becomes enlightened by taking the darkness and making it conscious. So it's like, how can you, how can you solve a problem that you don't recognize is a problem? Like you're deluding yourself. And while like I love and I'm all about like leaning into who we want to be and use directing our thoughts that way, I think a lot of us, and I've certainly been guilty of this in my life, um, that subscribe to like the law of attraction. I like really believe in the law of attraction, but we can go too far where we're pretending like we we don't have have anything fucking wrong with us or we're pretending like we never made a mistake or like we never, we don't have anything in the past to clean up. And sometimes that shit in the past is treasure. It's treasure. It's literally the key to going the way we want to go because it's it's pointing, it's, it's literally an arrow, life pointing an arrow to the point that like you need to work on. It's like, like the gym, it's like, because one of us have big biceps and like very small quadriceps, you know? And it's like that that trigger point, that that shadow, that thing that comes up that you're embarrassed about. That's the thing. It's like, what is what is this? What are you hiding? What is the thing that you're embarrassed about? What is the thing you're scared to say? So like, I think I want to share one or two of those now because I don't want to talk about this just conceptually. Because, A, my life, you know, not to, like, brag, and I I think your audience is, like, um, intelligent enough to hear the the difference. We've touched on a few themes already. One is, like, that this external success doesn't equal internal peace, right? It's a theme that I'm sure sure you've touched on a million times in this podcast. But... I'm glad we touched on it because like I've lived this life and I've had insane accomplishments, man. Like insane accomplishment, like financial fame, adventure, like, and so 
for me to say it, I know it's different because like I actually lived it. Yeah. And I know, I remember when I was 18 and people say, money doesn't buy happiness. I go, yeah, yeah, but in my head, I go, you don't know how much money I'm about to make. <laughs> I'm different, yeah. you know? And we all are different. We are special, right? But there are some universal. So I just hope like me saying my story because I've I've lived this. Yeah. Like I'm not a, I'm not a guy who just like came online one day. I was like, you know, these are the keys of life. Bro. Like I've I've lived this life. I almost died twice in the last five years. Like I've lived this. So that's theme number one. Theme number two we're talking about is the the shadow. So what actually came up for me, man? Like the first time I was there, like man, I, I like there's two friends of mine, two different two instances. I screwed these guys out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. We wrote songs together and because they were newer than me and I leveraged they they you know they they needed the cut because they were starting their careers. I said, I'm gonna take this percent, I'm gonna take 25, you take, you're gonna take 10, even though we did the same amount of work. Well, listen, man, you with that with the hit song, it's a lot of money. So I'm sitting there on this retreat and I'm like, and I start the retreat like, man, I'm so holy. Like who would even think to do this retreat? I'm, I'm going to meditate for seven days or 14 days. It was the first time it was seven days. And I'm like, and on the fourth or fifth day, like this thought, this memory comes up. It's like years before. And it's like, no, nah, man, you ain't that holy. And I love this other quote. I don't I don't know who said it, but it says, if if you're to enter the inner temple, you can leave no enemies behind. So it means like if you want to go to the next level in your spiritual practice, in your life, you actually need to clean up all the shit on this level. Right? It's like we want to just sit down and close our eyes, take some ayahuasca or whatever, and go, okay, I'm going to the next level. Meanwhile, like, we don't have our relationship with our parents straight. We don't have our relationship with our brothers and sisters straight. We've done things that we don't deserve to go to the next level yet. We need to, look, we can't change the past. But what we can do is acknowledge, learn, and make it right if we, if we can. So what, for me, like, when I left that retreat, is like, the pain I had to feel for those days, the remaining days is like, it's horrible because you can't go anywhere. That enough is like, all right, I got to pick up the phone and that's really going to suck and apologize and change these contracts and also write a fucking check, you know, to both these guys. Hmm. But it's like if I go back to that retreat center, I don't want, I don't want to have to do those two days again, you know. And it's like a hundred of those. I do keep in the back of my mind now, like, hey man, you ever have to go back? <laughs> like, it kind of is like, don't don't do any dumb shit this year, you know. So I have to like clean clean that up. like intense man we're all on that path of both being and becoming right and especially we get enchanted and to this uh you know idealistic state in the future of course we all want to better our lives and you know um create the life of our dreams and i love that and i love the power of manifestation and a lot of things that i do want to dive into later in this conversation um but ultimately who we are being in our given moment any time in our day that is our experience of life right and so if we're caught up in this wheel of always achieving and trying to become something other than where we're at it just sucks all the joy from the present moment and so i love that young quote that you brought up of going into the unconscious and, and bringing forth and shedding a light on these things because these disowned parts of ourselves, they are like leeches or parasites that are draining life force energy away yeah. from us that we're not aware of. Yeah. And so you going back and like actually doing that, first, you can't change what you're not aware of. So you brought your awareness to those things. And then you decided to be a man of integrity and 
become responsible and take it, you know, and, and, and own up to your accountability of what you need to do to, to right those wrongs. And uh, I can just only imagine the ripples that that now carries for the rest of your life. Yeah. So that's, I should have, I should have hit on this instead of just saying is intense, but on the other side of this really difficult, like reckoning and, and coming to terms at, but is like it, it no longer has power over you. And and you you're drawing a line in the sand. Hey, hey, I'm not going to do that again. And we can't correct things that aren't conscious. And so by making it conscious, like you actually, I take a step going this way, right? If we do, I know some people listen to audio, but we're taking a step going towards the the man I want to be that I'd be proud of. Mm. And there's a lot of liberation on the other side of that. There's a lot of liberation for me to be able to talk about it now on these, on like publicly, you know? So it's like the work is hard. That shadow work is difficult. It's not fun because the initial thing, like life, life is, takes all our energy anyway. Like life is happening all the time, right? Most of us feel like we're already at a hundred percent and then, some challenge comes up pointing to maybe something we need to work on in ourselves. Like, whoa, that reaction to that thing was not commensurate with the with the stimulus. <laughs> like, what was that about? And then it's like, fuck, man, I gotta deal with that thing now. I have to like look at this ugly part of myself now. But it really is treasure. It really is treasure. And when I look at all these accomplishments like music to walk to climb i think countries are wide mountains are tall but the man that i've become is my best my best album of all mm. you know so like the the who who you're becoming the, like this, this is the art this is like the 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 macro project everything else lives inside of that and do i just want to make that thing as beautiful as as I can. It's a, a powerful note also just for the listeners to take a moment, whether it's 30 minutes or uh, a day or a few hours or a couple weeks. If you just, like go through and just as a practice, as an exercise to write down all the tabs that you have open and to like purge all the things that are unprocessed kind of on a piece of paper. So you take it out of like a circular kind of loop in your mind and put it linear on a piece of paper. You can see it. Um, I think that's just so beautiful because then you reconcile those things, you free up so much more energy, and then you get access to more of who you truly are. As you have been on the journey, as the the man you're becoming is the greatest album mm -hmm. of all, that's mm -hmm. so beautiful, man. What have you discovered is the the symphony of that? What does that sound like? What is the melody of that album of you? What have yeah. you discovered is in the truest essence of who you are? Yeah. Well, I want to add on what you said, yeah. and then I'm going to swing back yeah. to that. I love what you said, putting it down on paper. And I, I, I would just add a little bit to it. Like take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle and write down on the left side the tabs you have open. The questions you should ask are, what am I embarrassed about? What am I hiding? And on the other side, right, you can, what are you going to do about it? you do everything on that right side, it's like a new life begins. Mm. I really believe that. Beautiful. The melody of who I'm becoming, man. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, um, I'm building the ship as I sail, right? But uh, you, know, you know that Nietzsche quote, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how, right? And I just finished rereading Man's Search for Meaning. Right, and it's like how how important the why is. Literally, it's life or death. You know, at least in the Nazi concentration camps, yep. that was life or death. Having a why to live, you didn't have a why to live, you, you die, according to Viktor Frankl, what he observed. Now, most of us, we we go through life, we don't have such dire circumstances, so we won't physically die if we don't have a why, if we don't have a purpose. But we'll die while we're still living. Right. And I've been there, man. I, I know that feeling to like wake up and go, 
God, this is it. Like, all this stuff on my calendar is cool. But I don't care about it. Why? Because I didn't have a why. And so for me, my why, and, and the other thing I love about Frankel's book is just like, there's no overarching meaning of life. There's no like one conceptual meaning of life, he says. There's a meaning of life that's individual to each of us every day. He said, don't act like we're, we're always sizing up. I do this all the time, I'm always sizing up the delta between what my life is and what I expect out of life. And if there's a big gap between those two things, I'm pissed off. What a shitty way to live. He goes, ask a different question. He said, ask what life is expecting out of you. We're, we're here. We each have a duty. We have a responsibility. For me, like my life, my purpose, I see here feeling no, my purpose is to give love. I see here feeling no, my purpose is to be a kind artist who creates transcendence for many other people, right? That's, that's the frame from which I do my work. I run my businesses. I create my experiences. I create my art. And it's easy to lose sight of it. Sometimes I look at, I still, I'll, I'll pull up the daily schedule. It's full of shit. Like I was saying, right, right before we did this podcast, I'm like, we got to meditate a couple minutes before we start because my head's spinning. And sometimes it's as easy, another two columns. You have your, on the left side, you have your schedule what you're doing that day, a call at eight, another thing at nine, whatever podcast. On the other side, why? Everything on my schedule has a why, but sometimes I forget it. If we remember our why, that's where the juice of life is, you know? And so the colors that have ultimately be on the canvas of my life, man, I don't even know all of them yet. Like, if I were to go five years ago, my life is like beyond the wildest dreams I had five years ago. Seriously, like 30 years old, I was like looking in the mirror in this guest house in West Hollywood after a breakup, like thinking like, dude, like, and I was already successful. I already had millions of dollars. I had already been nominated for a Grammy. I'm just thinking like, I know there's more inside me than this. Like what there's like, I don't want to do this. Like what, what is missing? Like, flash cut to now, what happened in the last five years? My life is beyond my wildest dreams. So I think some of the notes in my symphony are, will include growth, will include being a student, will include being a teacher, will include being a father, and will include hopefully a lot of fun, man, and <laughs> happiness, you know? Mm. Yeah. So beautiful, man. I loved everything that you just shared. Something that's really stuck out every single time that we get together, I've heard you share multiple times. You're like, I got a lot of love to give, man. I know I got a lot of love. I got more to share. I got um, a lot of love to bring forth in the world. And it's cool to have that reframe of instead of just asking what can I use life for in order to better my own like small limited self-perception and you know achieve more and more to well, how does life want to use me? The gifts that have been given to me are upon me to unravel, ununwrap. And then my gift back to life is then to share those gifts. And so you've been on the process for the past, you know, 30 plus years of discovering what your gifts are. How has God endowed you with certain skill sets and knowledge and powers. And then you're on the on the journey of now sharing that with incredible people all over the world through your music, through your art, through your retreats, through many things that you're doing. And so I love how you brought up Frankel's kind of framework of logotherapy to like really understand and, and claim what that why is in your life, really discover what that is. And there's an innumerable ways in which we can life can use us, right? There is a unique flavor in which you can show up in life that is unique to you, that yeah. is not unique to somebody else. And the process of unraveling and discovering that, that's like a reason for being. That's a reason to get up and be excited to share and be of service in the world. And so 
anything you want to else share on how important it is for us to have a vision of a future that is really exciting for us as we move into the world? It's it's one of the most important things. And to to you touched on a few really important points right there. One is, you know, having a lot of love to give. I don't think I'm unique in this feeling. Like there's probably millions of people out there right now, many of which are listening to this, that have a feeling like they have more to give than they're giving. And I believe when you really look closely, your depression, your anger, your frustration, your sadness, often are a function of your love not being expressed. I think love is like water, like it has to flow out. When it, when it stays still, it becomes rancid and it turns to hate. And all of us have to find a way to, to really give all we have to give. And oftentimes those emotions, if we call them negative, the other emotions are just life reminding us like, hey, there's more there. There's more there. Period. Enter. Indent. (laughs) (laughs) So, then you asked about this compelling vision of the future. It's so important, man. We have, I lived years of my life where kind of the main book I was, I was living off of was The Power Now by Eckhart Tolle. What an incredible book. And I, I, would, I would be foolish to try to summarize it into a sentence, but one of the main themes is like, life is here and now. Like Ramdas, I remember, be here now. And that's a really important, I don't even want to say skill because it's, it's bigger than a skill. That's a really important reality to be able to get into to be able to be present and most of us like have no idea how to do because we're we're going 100 miles an hour like we don't know how to stop and be present and be here like we do it do it right now take a breath you know like i think knowing how to do that is one of the most important things in life that I've learned so far. But I've also learned it's not the only thing. Having this compelling vision of the future is equally as important. And that's what Frankel's book is about. One of the main things it's about is if you don't have a thing in the future, a version of a version and a vision of your own future that's exciting to you, you'll die inside. And if you do, you can overcome literally anything. And we can say literally anything because of that book where this man is like, these are the worst of all human conditions that we could even dream up. You know, starvation, frostbite, dehumanization, gas chambers, genocide. And here's a guy who's experiencing joy and transcendence in this scenario and surviving. How? Why? Because he had a compelling vision of the future. And for him, it's so personal, right? We each have to make our own. For him, it was, dude, I came in here with a book. They stole my book, my manuscript. I gotta survive because I'm gonna. I, he saw himself delivering lectures when he got out, like for this manuscript that I need to survive, rewrite it, coupled with his love for his wife. So, what is that for each of us, right? We each have to have a vision of our future six months from now, a year from now, five years from now that excites us. And so, people ask me all the time, like, dude, why did you walk across America? 
And there's a couple reasons for that. But one of them was the thought of being the motherfucker who got nominated for a Grammy, sold millions of records, and then say, you know what? I'm going to walk across this continent. I'm going to walk one-eighth the circumference of planet Earth. That excited me. Because if I was looking, if it wasn't me, it was someone else did that, I would go, that's the dopest motherfucker ever. And I want to be the dopest motherfucker ever to myself. It's not about other people. It's about having this vision of my life that's not compelling. It's compelling, but it's beyond compelling. It's exciting. It's inspiring. I got so tired of being inspired like listening to people like you who have so much wisdom and your guests who have so much wisdom and go, wow, that's a good point. It's a good point. It's a good point. They're inspired. I got inspired by them and watched a documentary. I was like, I'm so sick of getting inspired just sitting here on my couch. I want to be inspiring to me. And it changed, like, it's, it's, so it's always changing and it's individual and my walk is over now. So I have to recreate that. Just like every time I finish an album, when you get sit down to write the next one, it's like, oh my God, who am I now? Like I could try to make the, the album I just made because that was successful, but it's going to suck and be a less good version of that album. And it's like starting over. And so this, this, this practice of having a vision of the future, a direction that we're living into is so important and almost no one does it. Most people are floating through life, just being blown by the whims of other people's desires. You know what the ideas that are being fed to them, and like the the tectonic plates of of like what's happening in in society and civilization as a whole. But when you can say, "No, this is my life. I'm sovereign of my." my body, my spirit, my life. And this is the, the future I'm building for myself. And I'm going to take action every day to go that direction. And I'm going to fall a thousand times. I'm going to get lost over here, but I'm going to keep moving that way. And that's what living a life of faith, a life of consciousness and life of vision and creation is hmm. and so like I, I mean once you start doing that you can't go back like why would you want to yeah period enter indent <laughs> <laughs> so this is great man because you talked about you being in this position five years plus ago where you were in a guest bedroom looking at yourself in the mirror making a decision that you wanted to do certain things to become a man that you're proud of and then we all come into points where, all right, there's this vision of myself that I want to embody, that I want to become, that I know I'm capable of, because if I have a vision, if I can imagine something, that means it's possible for me. And so you have this vision first of walking across America. That whole journey that took you about six months is really like a microcosm of your life's journey. I feel like mm. making a big commitment of what you want to do and who you want to become, then your commitment is then going to be tested many, many times by life to see if you really are going to show up to the commitment like you originally intended. When you choose something, you're choosing everything that's in the way to get there as well. One of the big tests is when you got bit by a rattlesnake on that journey. Yeah. That's an example of life giving you a test on a challenge to see if you're going to really follow through when you had all the excuse to stop. Can you just take us through that moment? Because it's definitely very yeah, unique. <laughs> absolutely. Like you, 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 you say you're choosing the, the challenges along the way. And I would argue, ultimately, you know, I like a goal that's so big. If I get it, it obliterates all my other goals because it's going to change who I am if I get there. Right? Like I don't even know. I knew if I get to the other side of this country, I'm not even going to recognize myself. I'm not some like hard dude. I didn't go to the army. Or that. I'm a, like a Jewish kid from the suburbs of Detroit who wrote songs 
in rooms with no windows. For me to do that, like do this was insane. It was scary. The people I worked with in the music industry said, dude, this is a career ending decision. And I didn't know, A, if I was going to hurt myself. Like, I didn't know if my body could actually do this. And if I did do it, if I was going to cause permanent damage. I didn't know if they were right, my music career would be killed. And I didn't know if I was able to actually do it. Like, I I might fail in front of everybody. And this is like the special sauce in like any project that's worthwhile is the risk of unequivocal failure. And knowing that the person you are when you're starting isn't good enough to get it done. It just isn't fucking good enough. Like for me to make it across, I have to become a new man. The hard way. And so it's not like the challenges are like a little sprinkle on top of what you're choosing. No, you're choosing the challenges. That's the whole fucking point is I want to feel what it's like to be challenged in a real way and then choose, I'm gonna keep going anyways. It's the only way we grow. You know, I think, I like to think when things are really going good and smooth and I'm chilling that I'm growing and maybe I am in some small way, but when we really grow, we're, we're in some pain. And so I, I think we train for the hard things in life that we don't choose by choosing to do hard things. Mm. You asked about the rattlesnake. So when I walked across America, I post on social media that anyone can walk with me. I say, if you find me, you can walk with me. And people came from all over the United States. Sometimes they drove eight, nine hours. And when they came, I always asked them one question, which was, if I pray for you, what should I pray for? Usually I got back like a one word answer, you know, Success, um, love, happiness, this kind of thing. One time I met this 21-year-old named Rowan on the Wallapai Reservation. And I asked him that question. And he looked at me and he said, Mike, five years ago, my father died from drinking. And... Three years ago, my only sibling, my big brother, died from drinking. And just three months ago, my mom died from drinking. He said, if you pray for me, pray for my sobriety. Because I'm the only one left. Dude, I walked like across New Jersey. I walked across Pennsylvania where I shared the road with Amish buggies. I walked in Ohio and it started to hurt like really bad. It was way worse than I thought it would be. Way worse. But I kept going. I walked across Indiana and Illinois. I walked across Missouri during a heat wave. And it was floods. I walked across Kansas. I walked into Colorado. I could just see the Rocky Mountains on the horizon. I had walked 1,797 miles. And I was taking a step and there's two two fans with me that day. And ow! This pain like shot up my left leg. And after... The pain, I heard a sound I didn't want to hear, and that was shh, shh, shh. I thought, like, fuck, man, like, I just got bit by a rattlesnake. And I was like, 
man, you're supposed to rattle first, my dude. Like <laughs> he flipped it on me. <laughs> you would, it's just the rattle and then I stay away. From, but there's two ways to get bit by a snake. One is to be screwing around with it. The other is to surprise it. So I surprised it. I didn't see it. It didn't see me. And it was just being a snake. I was sitting there and there were two, two men that came to walk with me that day. And they started all kind of like freak out a little bit. And, you know, the the bite hurt. The actual bite of the bite hurt. But it didn't hurt wor- worse than the rest of my body. So I was like used to being in pain at this point. So I was like joking around. And, you know, they're trying to call 911. We didn't have service. So they're like running. They they find oh, like a bar and they call 911. Meanwhile... You know, I start to kind of like fade away. This is sort of darkness coming in from the edges of my awareness. And I would I would leave. And I would kind of like wake back up. It happened a couple of times and they let me talk to 911 and I asked, um, you know, am I gonna die? And the voice on the other end of the phone said, I, I don't know, sir. And she said, you know, I, I've sent two ambulances from two different directions and a, and a chopper, whichever one gets there first, get in. And at this point, I'm realizing like that, you know, this this isn't a bee sting. You know, I'm in the middle of nowhere and this could be, this could be the end of my life. And I just decided, you know, eventually what what actually got there first was an ambulance. I, I made the decision, you know, hey, if this, hopefully it isn't, but if it is, you know, the last few hours of my life, yeah, I don't want to spend the last few hours of my life worrying about if this is the last few hours of my life. So I'm just going to enjoy my last few hours. And I felt an immense amount of peace in the back of that ambulance. And I was just, you know, doing what we were doing before the podcast, only looking at the red paint on the wall of the ambulance door and going, wow, this, you know, might be the last time I see red and how like lush that color is and just enjoying being alive, you know, which is what we should always be doing, right? I get to the hospital and I spent three nights in the ICU. My legs swelled to the size of an elephant trunk. And I went from walking 24 miles a day to not being able to walk to the bathroom, you know? They sent me home to heal. I had a walker and then eventually crutches. And after a lot of PT and rest, like a funny thing happened, Andre, is I I got better. But here's the here's the hardest part of the snake bite is I'm sitting at home now in air conditioning. The rest of my body actually feels a lot better besides the messed up leg because like I I was in pain, man. People are taking care of me, cooking for me. And let's be real, I'm getting an insane amount of attention, not only from my friends and family, but from like the world in general. I'm on the news my heroes are DM- John Mayer's DMing me. Feel better soon, bro. Like David Goggins is writing me. Like all, all these people I looked up to, either musically or whatever, they're all writing to me. I'm, so I'm getting all this attention for being hurt. And so there's a part of my psyche that's going, hey, when you're hurt, you get more love. And so that part of my psyche didn't want to get better. It wanted to stay hurt. So you could keep getting the love. So the hardest part, 
of the snake bite was was realizing through I got a decision to make. I could either A, go home to my life of fame and luxury and Uber Eats and looking in the mirror feeling like there's got to be more. Or I can be like, go back to the blistering foot pain, the sweltering heat, the sides of the roads where the semi trucks almost hit me every single day. This path like really sucked and it hurt a lot, but it, it taught me the difference between reasons and excuses. And like when it comes to things I care about, my reasons to quit are always just excuses in disguise. And it's like, dude, this was the best reason to quit of all time. You know, it was like such a good reason to quit that if I did quit, no one would even consider me a quitter. But I wasn't doing it for most people. And so I'm a little different. Like most of us, we we visualize, we do use the law of attraction. We We see ourselves being successful and I do that. Like a thousand times I saw myself getting into that ocean on the other side. That's important. But I also visualize how am I, how am I going to react when things go wrong? Because you try to walk 3,000 miles across America, something's going to go wrong. And if you're not prepared for that mentally, you'll quit. And if you think like, oh, this thing's going wrong because my my law of attraction practice was, it's like, dude, no, like, let's be real. You have a, you have a vision of the future. You can see yourself doing it, but like, this shit's going to be hard. Something's going to get fucked up. Like, that's the whole reason you want to go is to deal with that. And so I rehearsed not only myself getting in the ocean, but I rehearsed, like, I remember before I started, I said, if I break my leg, man, what am I going to do? I saw myself just like healing my leg and then going back to the spot where I got hurt and finishing. And so I didn't break my leg. I got bit by a snake. But that rehearsal and that muscle I had started to build was stronger than that part of my psyche that wanted to stay hurt to get attention. And so for me, like this was, this is a fucking crossroads. You know, it's like, I'm either going to go back and be this like shell of myself, shell of my potential, or am I actually going to become somebody I'm proud of? And I decided to go back to the exact spot that that snake bit me and I, I took a step, man. And it was hard. Like I was scared. I still have nightmares about snakes this fucking day, bro. Like. But it's like, who who does this? Like, who would even think, who would even think to do this? And so while people may not understand, like, why I would ever even start this journey, they, maybe they look at me like some people, even my friends, you know, say, like, dude, like, why are you doing this to yourself? Like, you, you don't get it. I just for myself. And you know, like they'll never understand what it's like to put yourself in a position that's so far out of your comfort zone. Face death. And decide to keep going. I walked a thousand more miles and on October 18th, 2019, I dove face first in the Pacific Ocean. And there's no going back from there. The many iterations of you that had to die in order for the new version of you to be born is just, it's that hero's journey. You know, Joseph Campbell is like, you you have that call to a journey. You have that refusal to call. You go through that initiation um, and you go through that moment of death and rebirth. And like you spoke to who you were in the beginning versus who you were at the end had to be two completely different people by virtue of how challenging the journey was. And so I just think there's so many lessons in what you shared. We could pull on so many of them, but for the listeners to like, it doesn't have to be uh, 
something that's so physically challenging like a walk across America. No. Everybody has their version of what that might look like though. You know, whatever that challenge is that is intimidating, but they know will be so rewarding. And now that you have that under your belt, you discovered more of what you're actually made of. And you carry that confidence and knowing and gnosis with you in everything that you do. And I feel like that's when you're unshakable. A series of like so many of those moments, you have dozens of those experiences under your belt. By midlife, you, man, you just carry so much power with you where you go and your word carries weight. Um, And uh, so, so beautiful, man. Thank Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a good distinction though. Like, and we've touched on this theme a few times or rather it's a thread that runs through a few of the themes we touched on, which is it's different for each person. So like another person's version of the walk may not be physical in nature at all. I know my, my, like the thing that scares me the most isn't a physical challenge at all right now. (laughs) You know, that's like the areas I'm like growing the most in is, is passionate intimacy and partnership. Right. And like, that's way scary to me to go. If you're like, yo, you have to go climb Everest again. Like, come on, let's do it. (laughs) But that is like, that's, like that's my journey now. Yeah. So we have to we have to look at have the courage to look where we're scared and put something in front of us that inspires us go, hey, if I got to the other side of this, man, how cool would my life be? And it's it's so individual. It's so individual. And um, you know, that was my my version of that for that chapter. And it's, it's like, what's what's yours? Yeah. yeah. It's almost as if those, like, our greatest gifts in life are hidden in our challenges. And by virtue of, like, owning those and whatever, you know, the, the intimacy challenges or the relationship stuff, by going through and becoming who you need to be to reconcile that stuff within you, you discover so much more of, like we spoke to earlier, that, like, vital life force energy that now is regained back to you. And you have a new gift that's, that's unlocked. And you get more access to life and expression and who you are, which is a... So beautiful, man. It's like, bro, we, we as humans, we sell ourselves so short. And by the time you're old enough to listen to this podcast, you already have so many ideas about who you are and who you aren't. And most of those ideas, which make up one's identity, oh, I could do this or I could never do this. Like they're complete and utter bullshit. And it's like, if you take, we are nature's greatest miracle, literally. Like we take our veins and capillaries, already put them in a line, they stretch around the earth. Like it's insane, the miracle that we are. And so to like put limitations on oneself, oh, I could never do that. I'm not that kind of person. Like anytime you say that, that's the direction you should go. You are that kind of person. If it's humanly possible, I know I can do it. If someone else did it, I know I can do it, right? Like, so it's just so exciting to be alive and to look back six months ago, dude, (laughs) I never thought I'd become who I am now. I never thought I'd become who I am now. And that kind of pride is something like it can't be bought. It cannot be bought. Got to be earned. Got to be earned. And, I, and, and it's, it also has to be executed upon. Like our moment, and, and I'm contradicting myself too, because at the beginning of the, our, our talk today, I talked about how in the present moment earns you no points. Yeah. These accomplishments. And they're both true. They're both true. It's being and becoming. It's the great paradox of life, you know? It, We find so much exuberance and stillness and expression and and all of it, you know? And so I wanted to touch on both because one without the other isn't isn't whole, it's not complete. I think we've both been so lucky and fortunate uh, and have so much gratitude for meeting individuals along our path that were like pointed Mm. into one area of life um, or one discovery or idea that kind of unlocked a lot within us. There's a couple people that I have in mind for you and and for myself as well. 
who who was one of the first people that put you onto the power of your mind and thoughts earlier on in your journey? Oh, that's such a good question. Is Big Sean? Have you had him on? I haven't. He he'd be incredible. I'd love to. Yeah. So, um, I, I can't remember. We're both from Michigan. I was born in Detroit. I grew up in a suburb of Detroit. And when I was 18, I met Big Sean. Um, Before he was big. Yeah, <laughs> we were both 18. We're yeah. the same age. And uh, he actually didn't have his name yet. Right. He had a different name he was going by. And um, I became a part of his crew. So I used to just do beats for him and write songs for him. And um, he got signed to Kanye and that changed my life. Before I knew what the law of attraction was, I started utilizing it by default because of Sean. He was this guy, he's my buddy. We used to rap together and his hip hop is competitive, right? So I always think I'm the best, you know? And then he got signed, he got a record deal. I'm like, dude, if he can get a record deal, I can get a record deal for sure. And it changed my belief around what I was capable of in my music career. And once that belief changed, it was like eight, nine months, I had a record deal. So now you got like two guys in the same little friend group, both like, <laughs> anyways, I'll, I'll try to amend this story so it's not mm -hmm. super long. Sean's career got to a point like at the beginning, we all have different trajectories. His was very slow at the beginning. So much so, you know, signed, I think three, four years and, Nothing was really happening. Even though he got the record deal, he, nothing really happened. I think he was even on the verge of like losing the record deal. And then all of a sudden it was like, bang. He's like, he got so much better. His music got better. He, he started getting super successful. He had a hit song. And then most importantly, I went to see him now in LA. We're in like a nice studio. You imagine from my mom's basement four years or five years before. We're in the studio and like everything's going good for him externally, but also he's like glowing, right? And you've been around people like this. They're just like glowing. Just being around them makes you feel good, right? And, and so much so like I went home that night and I still felt good. I'm like, so the next day I saw him again. And I'm like in the studio. I'm like, dude, what? Like, what are you doing? Like, what's going on with you? You're like, and mind you, I had no spiritual part of my life. Basically, we didn't, we did, we, I was raised like a secular version of Judaism, not because my parents didn't believe in God, because they, they said they wanted us to be able to choose. So they didn't want to put us in a religion and say, when you're an adult, you can pick, which I understand. But I didn't have, like, I didn't believe in God. I, like, I was a materialist. I, like, if I could see it, it was real, you know, and, and kind of like a little bit cynical. So here's this guy, my buddy, he's glowing. Everything's going well. Like he's making more money. He's getting more famous. I'm like, dude, what's he? And so I asked like, well, what are you doing? He goes, you got to read two books. First was The Alchemist. And the second was Asking It Is Given by Esther and Jerry Hicks. And so I read these two books and it was like, it just, it just like, opened the window and the breeze started to come in. And from there, you know, my, my, my spiritual life started. My spiritual life started from, from him. Mm. And so he's changed my life a few times. One is he showed me and like in our little friend group now, there's three of us been nominated for Grammys, right? So it's like insane just him living his life changed what we all thought was possible. And then, so there's like, he started my music career and then like, he enabled me to have a spiritual life. He was my doorway to having a spiritual life. And so he'll like, he, he, he'll never know how much he changed everything for me. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Yeah. Ram Das was another individual. Who yeah. Here, right? <laughs> Ram diggity dog. <laughs> Ram diggity dog. I think I'm the first person to ever say that. Ram diggity dog. <laughs> Ram diggity dog. 
I think you, I mean, you mentioned be here now and a couple of things earlier, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, not many people have actually met him in the flesh. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I know there's nothing quite as transforming as meeting an individual mm-hmm. who is an embodiment of, of what they preach, who really like lives it when they glow when they radiate. Yeah. That actually, I feel like enables you to, to go down that path and to explore it because you've actually seen and you've tasted, you've realized it's really possible. It's there. You see it. Um, whereas if it's just like an intellectualized idea or like a cool spiritual, you know, idea from a text, it can't all, it doesn't always carry the same weight. Mm-hmm. So when you met Ram Das, what was Ram Diggity Dal? <laughs> <laughs> what was, <laughs> it's hilarious. What, uh, what was that like, man? How was that transformative? Ooh, shout outs to my friend Milo who took me. Um, this is like flash cut a few, few years further in my journey since I've read those books that Sean gave me. And now I've like begun meditating and I'm like, you know, voraciously consuming different spiritual texts and, um, you know, just like experimenting, experimenting with fasting. Cause I'm curious, experimenting with like semen retention. Cause I'm curious, like just experimenting and like with, you know, changing my consciousness and trying to elevate my consciousness and this whole thing. And by the time I I, I got to meet Ram Dass, I had already, you know, heard a lot of his lectures. I had read Be Here Now, which is just a incredibly transcendent book, you know. I highly recommend it. Um, it's actually just a transcription of one of his lectures, something he said live. Anyways, my buddy Milo got darshan for us with ram das and this is like late stage ram das so he'd had a stroke um he's in like a wheelchair electric wheelchair and you know half his body didn't work and his speech was very slow and so we we went into his home on maui and he you know like wheeled into the room and he started to talk to us and mostly andre he said things I'd already heard him say on his recordings or on, you know, in his books. And we sat with him for about 40 minutes. At which point Ram Dass looked at us, his big eyes, you know, and he just looked at us like he loved us so much. Like he, we could have said like, hi, I'm a serial killer. It's great to meet you. And he just would have loved you, you know. <laughs> He looked at us after these 40 minutes and he said, okay, it's time for you to go. I remember I stood up and I kissed him on the forehead because after these 40 minutes, I felt like he's like like my uncle or like my dad. You know what I mean? I felt so connected to him. And then I walked out of the house. I crossed the threshold of the front door and I looked outside and I just... I keeled over and this feeling of oneness swept over me. And it's like, dude, no drugs, no alcohol, like 100% sober. The only intoxicant that I was being influenced by was this love that he was emanating or had just emanated. And I'm looking outside and I see the clouds and the dirt on the road and the car door and the rusty gate. And I felt connected to all of it. Like we were all, I was just part of this beautiful oneness. And I remember thinking, man, I hope I feel like this when I wake up tomorrow. And of course when I woke up, I felt like my normal self, you know? But the reason that day was important to me wasn't just for the high experience, the transcendent experience, it was because, gosh, here's a guy who I don't think is special, meaning he's special and like he he did a lot of work and and he and he you know we're all special and he he shared his soul and and, and made an impact on the world, but he didn't have any like equipment or machinery that you and I don't have or anybody watching doesn't have. Like, I don't worship Ram Dass. I don't think he's, like, the savior. I think he's, like, a Jewish dude from Boston. Like, like I was a Jewish dude from Detroit, and he did the work, you know? And 
while I was already on my spiritual path and I was meditating, experimenting, there's still a corner of me going, is this shit real? You know, like, am I wasting my time? Like, am I crazy? Meditating on stuff, you know? And after that day, I don't know. Well, 100% this is real. You know, like, I don't need to, I don't need to like read a study on what I felt that day. It was real. Inside, like, I felt it. And what I felt was someone who did the work and was emanating love to such an extent that it made me literally feel like I was on a psychedelic just from being around them. Also, another distinction, not from anything he said. Mm -hmm. I already heard all the shit he said and he could barely talk. He had a stroke. Like Mm -hmm. it was his being. And so for me, that was a that was a changing an inflection point because I thought, wow, A, that's possible. B, I want people to feel like that when they're around me. And C, I can't think of anything else more important to work on. And so it, it changed my life. Mm. I similarly had an experience at 19 where I met an individual where his presence was uh, also impactful like that. And I feel like when you come in contact with did you tell the story on the podcast? Have I told it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've shared it a couple times. Um, but it's like a reference point, you know? You meet an individual who embodies like a level, a certain level of mm-hmm. purity or like they've done the work within their own consciousness. That reference point becomes really inspiring and enabling for you to realize that it's possible that they don't have special equipment, you know? They yeah. got the same human flesh suit as you. And so... I think that reference point is really powerful once you see it, once you experience it. And then for me, I wanted to go on the journey of like, all right, this is possible. I've seen what the human consciousness is capable enough if you purify your system. And so also I've seen you over the past, you know, five plus years, like take the purification of your mind, body, spirit to a whole nother level. You're very Mm. fit. You love eating sprouts. (laughs) You meditate, you do, you're doing the work. Um, so, you know, moments like that where you meet Ram Dass or have those reference points and you see what's possible. I'm just curious to see what is your kind of like flow like now in life and and what are you really prioritizing? You know, I know your health is a huge one. You mean like, like my day-to-day yeah, flow? Day-to-day flow or just like really what are you prioritizing um, to, to arrive at that place authentically where you can feel that exuberant, you know? Yeah. So I think there's there's like a few main areas of life. And ideally, like, they're all growing. Um, There's passionate intimacy. There's family life. There's physical health, vitality. There's career. Um, There's spiritual growth. You know, there's learning. And, you know, we could all, like, maybe add a few or subtract a few depending on what, like, our, our path is. Right. And so, you know, I have a very simple practice, which is like, I have a, (laughs) I have a, like a thing, a document in my Evernote, which has all those areas listed. And every week I write down like what I did to, to take steps in each one of the areas. A, that's important because sometimes you can be winning and feel like you're losing, right? Where you're like, you're crushing life. And if you're like us, you know, you're a creator and you're moving forward, I shouldn't project on you. If you're like me, you're like, you're like, you're knocking shit off the list. Like that's part of like my masculine energy, right? And it's like, without taking a moment to go, wow, like look at all the shit I did today or look at all the shit I did this week. You can really be doing a great job and feeling like you're not. So A, that's important. B, um, that list, like sometimes I'll look and go, dude, like this, this another, another category is giving back, right? Sometimes I'll look and there's a category and it's like, hey, there's nothing there this week or like there's only one thing. So um, ideally, like I'm trying to have all those things grow. It's not enough to like try to keep them the same because when you try to keep things the same, they actually are dying. Like you, you either like, I study piano, you know, it's like you you do too. Like you're either get be- you're either getting better or you're getting worse. Mm. So my flow, like on a daily basis, um, 
You know, I start with my spirit and my body. One of the most important things, like, this is like, <laughs> you know, I say, said a lot of like uh, <laughs> big ideas today. Maybe this is like the thing that I actually help people the most. It's so it's like silly and simple. I have, I have my phone and then I have my old phone. And I know that's sort of like a privileged thing. People like trading, right? But I'm, you know, abundant enough. I have, I'm able to keep, hang on to my old phone. My old phone, I've deleted every app off it except Notes, Evernote, Podcasts, Spotify. And I think that's it, right? And so there's no social media on it. It doesn't have a SIM card. It doesn't. The, the messages app, like you can't delete that for whatever reason, but it's not signed in. So it's like, it's only there for me to like listen to music or to something that's going to inspire me, like feed my mind or for me to record inspiration. Should I have it? Another app is the voice memos because I get song ideas, right? And so after like dinner, you know, I have a few more hours of texting, whatever, my main phone gets turned off. Like a lot of people don't even know how to actually turn their phone off. I turn it off and I put it like in this corner where I don't see it and it's charging, whatever, it's done. And then I have this other phone and the main phone is like, it's done. And so I go to bed. A lot of times I leave the other phone out of the room. I probably should do that with the EMF, whatever. But I like to sometimes listen to like noise or a lecture or something while I go to sleep. And when I wake up, the, the main phone is still off. And what this allows me to do is start my day on offense. I'm creating every morning. I'm not reacting. Because if I pick up that main phone, dude, I live like a big life. I'm up to things. I have big goals. It's, it's just a thousand things people want from me to request, whatever. I'll get to them all, you know, if, if, if they advance things forward but not first. First, I'm going to create. So I have that phone. I wake up, I put music on that like gives me energy. Still to this day, I want to be really honest and real. To this day, like I'm talking this morning, when I wake up, I feel like I don't want to get out of bed. I don't wake up like, fuck yeah. I wake up like, God damn do all this shit today that's how i wake up pretty much every morning not every morning but almost every morning i used to think that i had to stay if i woke up like that that's how that's the state i have to stay in the rest of the day i now know that is bullshit i'm in control of my state my mood my energy look we're, none of us are perfect but like we have a say over how we feel so I want to be really real. Like, dude, I've made millions of dollars. I got known for a Grammy. I've walked across America. I wake up and I feel like, God damn it. Pretty much every day. I wake up, I put a song on that gets me out. Yes. And I start, I start doing incantations. I start going, I am joy. I am faith. I am love. Yes. What if this is the best day of my life? You start to feel a little silly when you first start doing it. You're like, dude, I'm doing this thing. I do this every day. Every day I'm like, God, I'm like doing it. I put out this little playlist, gets me going. Dude, I'm like, yes, yes. I start doing it. After a minute, two minutes, three minutes, I'm brushing my teeth, you know, and I'm getting it going. I use the bathroom. I've still got the music on. I do this minimum, minimum 10 minutes every day of talking to myself. Mm -hmm. I am joy. I am faith. I am love. I'm looking in the mirror. I love you. You know, I, I like, I am a king. I am, I'm unstoppable. I am the light. I used to believe that I used to demand the circumstances of my light provide of my life provide me with light. I now know that I am the light that shines upon my circumstance. Like I just keep saying this. How can I celebrate all the blessings in my life? God has given me even more right now. How would God see this right now? I might pose and see here feeling no. My purpose is to give love. I might pose and see here feeling no. Life is a gift. I like, bro, I, I might pose and see here feeling no. Life is sacred. I might pose. There were times in my life where I was close to death. In those moments, all I wanted was more life. This is that more life. I'm, in, I'm like, bro, by the time, like, I'm get feeling it now. This took 30 seconds, right? So I'm doing this 10 minutes every day. I, like, now I've taken this emotion that I feel every day, right? I teach what I need to learn. I 
I believe like we as teachers, we don't get like perfect lives. We get, we get challenges so we can learn how to overcome and share what we learn. So like I change this feeling every morning. Then if I have time, I'll do a sitting meditation. If not, I go train and I'll train for an hour and a half, preferably outside. You know, we live in a beautiful place. I'm running in the park. I'm riding my gravel bike in the park. Maybe I'm lifting, maybe I'm boxing, maybe I'm doing jujitsu and after that, if I didn't lift, I'm in the ice bath. Then I eat. I might call a friend and I could start working. And I like to, when I work, mind you, the phone is still fucking off this whole time. I got the other phone playing the music, right? No, like this is me creating the energy I want to put out into the world. I'm on offense. I am on offense, right? I'm not on defense. I am creating. I'm not reacting. So after this, when I go to work, Ideally, I'm doing the most creative thing I want to accomplish that day. Like, you know, I'm starting a podcast. I might have an idea. I might get into that. If I'm writing, working on an album, I'm getting into a song where, where it involves creation. I want to go right into creation. Administrative stuff, emails and stuff, right? Right. I run business, right? That's later. First, I want to create something, right? So if, if I'm doing that, that's first. And then, you know, I'm, I'm eating something healthy. I make a smoothie first. It's, garden like really healthy protein powder vegan put some broccoli sprouts in there mix it up man a lot of good stuff eat i usually eat twice a day you know second meal is usually like a big i call it the daddy polo salad it's like <laughs> bunch of sprouts and you know homemade dressing everything organic i love making my own food and i've gotten real serious about like what i put in my body and what i put on my body deodorants all stuff like natural whatever and so that's my life, man. I try to be outside as much as I can. And like, I love becoming friends with you because we go on walks when we're both here in the evening. And it's like, you put all that shit down and you, you move the ball forward and your goal is your life. And then, you know, we just are humans and we're outside in nature and remember what it's like to just be human. Mm -hmm. And so it's a beautiful life. I have a career, many different paths where, I'm inspired. I can be creative. And if I do a good job, I can make an impact. My father, rest his soul, he used to always tell me there's there's two H's in life, health and happiness. So, you know, I'm just on a mission. I want to make people healthier and happier. Let's go, man. You Let's got go. me fired up. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Yes. So powerful, man. And, you know, I loved all the ideas and threads that we explored in this podcast. And... The the person I spilled tea all over myself. Dude. It's all good. You're so lit, dude. You gotta cool yourself down. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Take the black bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she got fired up, man. It's good. Let's go. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> I do, by the way, I do that all like I always spill stuff. Yeah. Like I'll just be drinking. I get on my shirt. Look at this, dude. <laughs> That's this great, is dude. Classic. Classic Mike pose, pose move. move. It's good. It's all classic. good. Classic. <laughs> Perfectly <laughs> imperfect. Uh, but yeah, man, those practical, like how you live your life, how you show up, is uh, I'm sure just as impactful, or maybe more for some people to know, like what you can really do and reclaiming your life to become a creator, and not a creature of circumstance, like you spoke to, is just everything, man. You so start good. up. And don't get uh, don't get sucked into that black infinity box where mm -hmm. everybody wants your attention. And no, don't you you, you are a creature of God. You are a creation of God. Do not yes. get sucked into the samsaric sed seductiveness of just constant attention seeking, dopamine hitting. Yes, you know it, it's not how you want to start your day. You want to start your day with intention, with power. So I just love how you shared all of that because it's uh, it's how you really enter your day with power. And I also think it's really beautiful for you to share that you wake up and you don't feel like that most days. Because a lot of people I'm sure can resonate where they wake up and they got responsibility, they got challenges to face. We're all walking through different things in life that, yes. are, that are hard. And, um, but the fact that you can wake up and, and you don't have to stay in that state is I think a really powerful reminder. Huge. You yeah. Yes. Yeah. Man, this whole podcast, I'm just loving so much and it's just so cool to explore deeper into the mind and heart of, of you. Um, we could go forever. We can go forever. And uh, I also want to create space if you want to share a poem because we didn't oh, do that yet. I forgot about that. For, I, me too. We were just in flow. <laughs> and I want you, if you want to share something, bro, a song, a poem, anything, I'd love to open it up for you. Absolutely. 
I have two poems circling in my head right now. I'm trying to think which one would be more appropriate. Mm. I believe this to be the truth. And I pray it doesn't bore you. I don't believe life happens to you. I believe life happens for you. I believe this is heaven. I believe this is hell. I believe it's beautiful to be part of something bigger than yourself. I don't believe in dwelling on the things you never had. I believe I'm a good kid trying to convince the world I'm bad. Perhaps I showed up too soon. I don't belong. I believe I'm a poem, though you believe I'm a song. Or perhaps I'm the tool of another, a rock to be thrown at the wall. I believe those that really know say next to no words at all. <laughs> What's that say about you? What's that say about us? We're just two stars in a galaxy caught in the gravity of my own tour bus. I believe that angels sometimes wear tattoos. I believe we like to numb ourselves with shit food advertisements and bad news. But I'm not a savior, not even a savant. I didn't sing my most popular songs. That's all you really want. I believe in myself, in Super Matt Chatney. I believe that each one of us is free to believe what we want to believe. Andre, do you agree? I believe the prophet speaks softly. This whole thing is a dream. I believe beautiful things do not beg to be seen. I believe in God. I don't have a logical or scientific reason why I do not believe it's an old white man sitting on top of the sky. Rather, a twinkle in an iris, an iris purple in bloom. I believe you can be happy in December just like you could be sad in June. And sometimes people come along and they try to change you to somebody new. To which I say, don't ask the sun to shine more like the moon. I believe no one really knows what to do. But for some odd reason, I believe in everyone inside of this room. Even you, you, and you. I believe in love. Maybe I'm just naive, but I still believe. I still believe. Thank you. Thank you, man. I believe in you. <laughs> I believe in the light you have to shine, man. And I'm just so grateful for our connection and for sharing yourself on the podcast today. This has been so fun. Lots of laughs, lots of deep insight. This, Crushed it, man. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And this is just the beginning. It is. This is just the beginning for you, for me, and for everyone watching. This It is just the beginning. Like, it's so easy for us to look at our lives and go, gosh, like, look, this is what happened. To this is just the beginning. Mm. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> man, keep bringing. Sorry, I hijacked your outro. <laughs> no, that was great, dude. You bring enthusiasm into everywhere you go. And so I just appreciate that, man. And it's a good, it's a good reminder for all of us to use our will to inject joy into the moment. It's like you, you have that effect on people. You have that power. So you remind me of that, man. And so thank you again for coming on today. Thank you. And for everybody that's been tuning in to this episode of the Know Thyself Podcast. Thank you for coming on this journey. We really love to see, hear, feel from you guys, this community that's building, that we see the numbers online in the comments, but we know that each number represents a human being that is on a journey inwards and outwards. And hopefully the ideas 
and concepts and thoughts and stories shared today help you a little bit more on that journey every step of the way. Thank you for tuning into this episode. And until next time, be well. Thank you.